Fifth window of opportunity, I would suggest is you, is all of us. For the first time since the word genocide was invented by Raphael Lemkin, as Christopher mentioned, we are seeing, and we have seen, the formation of a mass movement of people willing to stand up against the genocide while it was and continues to happen. And I think this is the game changer that Sudan needs so, so desperately. I think if we look collectively, groups like this all over the United States, meeting in churches, meeting in synagogues, meeting here in schools, meeting in town halls, community centers, together we have the chance to do something that has never been done before, which is to create, potentially create, some kind of political cost, some kind of political price for politicians who don't take a meaningful stand against these kinds of human rights crimes while they're happening. So let's talk for just a minute about what a meaningful stand by a politician, by a diplomat, by a government official, by President Obama, by the United States Congress, what would that mean right now? Well, I think what's needed more than anything else uh, in Sudan is actually very simple and very cheap. And we've actually done it before in Sudan. More than anything else, I think the country needs from us, the United States, leading an international effort, what I would call a peace surge that gets at the root causes of war, the cycle of conflict that has occurred since independence that we talked about at the beginning, and the root causes of why genocide would be perpetrated in the context of that war. And back that peace surge up with real consequences for the commission of further crimes. We all know that America, by far, has the largest army in the world, but we also have the largest diplomatic corps in the world as well. We know how to make peace. We did it, we helped do it, in 2005 in southern Sudan, a war far bigger, with far more at stake than the war in the western part of the country today in Darfur. The U.S. led the peace process there. Secretary Powell talks about it as one of his accomplishments of his, uh, for, of his term in, as Secretary of State. And that was a war that everyone said, just like they're saying today about Darfur, was a hopeless war with divided rebels and, 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 and all the other kinds of reasons that people say Darfur is just an interminable, hopeless uh, conflict. So we actually do know what to do and how to do it if we want to end the crisis in Sudan. So back to Amina finally. Um, remember what she said, now that you know, you must do something. And that's something I think means raising our voices. I can tell you from my own experience, having worked in the, in the White House and the State Department, the United Nations and in Congress, that when voters like us in this room begin to raise our voices in unison, in a clear way, with certainty about our objective, attention will be paid. And the incredible thing in the 21st century is that we can raise our voices and fight genocide right from our laptops and right from our living rooms. And, and Mark Hannes, who's going to follow me, will tell you a little bit about the kind of things that you can do. And I will only frame the beginning, or sort of handing the, the, the baton to him by saying that if you look at the last century of this country's history, one can make the case that real changes have occurred in the context of people's movements. We've seen the real shifts occur in our historical development from the women's movement, from the civil rights movement, from the labor movement from the environmental movement, from the peace movement even in some cases. And finally, we have the outlines, the beginnings of an anti-genocide movement. And any one of us in this room can be part of it. The key is to look at your own skill set, look at the massive social networks that all of us have through all the new media tools that particularly students are so adept at utilizing. So that just the number in this room can be multiplied by 100 if we have a purpose 
which we want to alert people to know. I was looking at a, at a journal recently which talked about what were the most effective ways that got people involved or interested in causes. And the third most effective way that the poll, the poll uh, respondents cited was that they uh, had seen an ad that was very effective and they were compelled to respond in some way through action or through money, through, through charity. Second leading uh, response by people who were involved in causes uh, was that they saw some kind of, some celebrity got involved in a particular issue and they decided once they learned about the issue that they wanted to help too. But by far and away, the number one reason why people got involved in causes according to this fairly extensive study was because a friend or family member asked them to. Now how empowering is that for all of us in this room that have that believe in particular issues and causes and want to do something and have at our disposal things that Christopher and I didn't have 10, 15, 20 years ago in terms of our capacity and ability to organize and bring people together around issues and ideas and stories and causes that you hold dear to your hearts. The truth is, and I think Mark will make this case much stronger than I will, it really only takes 10 or 15 minutes a week to become a card-carrying member of this anti-genocide movement. If we make enough noise, if we turn enough light onto these issues and onto the solutions that are possible, then I think we can help bring an end to the conflict that continues to burn around the 21st century's first genocide. We must raise our voices for Amina and for all the survivors of the genocide in Sudan and in other genocides previous century and tell them as loudly as we can, not on our watch. Thank you very much.